Let us pray. Our understanding of your word comes from you, O God. Open our ears and our minds and our hearts to hear what you would have to say to us. Help us upon hearing to understand and upon understanding to act. In Jesus' name, amen. Reading from the first chapter of Acts. So when the disciples and Jesus had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in, in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've never preached on the ascension of Jesus. To be perfectly honest, I cannot say that I've ever wanted to preach on the ascension of Jesus. I think my aversion to preaching on the ascension began back in seminary, Those who took the standard ordination exams the year before I did were given this passage for their biblical exegesis. And pretty much to a person, everyone who came out of that half-day exam emerged looking like deer in headlights. And the apprehension continues. A friend saw me hunkered down in a corner of a coffee shop with my laptop a couple of weeks ago and came over to say hi. And when he learned I was working on a sermon, he said with a bit of amusement that he'd be glad to offer some insights. And when I told him I was preaching on the ascension of Jesus, he said, whoa, that's above my pay scale. (laughs) Got to go. And just this past week, those of us in my lectionary study group asked our leader, a retired professor of religion, about preaching on the ascension. And what followed was a very long pause. But here we are, or here the lectionary has led us to the ascension story. And so... If you're ready, up, up, and away we go. Biblical scholars are in general agreement that the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts are a two-volume work by the same author. While it's unclear who who the writer was, we'll call him Luke. Luke ends volume one with a one verse reference to the ascension of Jesus. He writes, while Jesus was blessing the disciples, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. At the beginning of the second volume, like most TV dramas these days, Luke provides his readers with a recap of where the first volume ended. And the second time around, he elaborates about the ascension. As they were watching, Jesus was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? For obvious reasons, this is not a story we can tackle from a literal perspective. It's reported that a noted Episcopalian bishop and Carl Sagan, that infamous astrophysicist, once had a conversation about the ascension of Jesus. Sagan evidently told the bishop, if Jesus literally ascended into the sky and traveled at the speed of light, then he hasn't yet escaped our galaxy. We know that people just don't float away. Well... Most people. There was one exception. His name was Larry Walters. 
From the time he was a young teen, Larry had the sense that he would someday be carried up into the heavens by balloons. And two decades later, when he was 33, it happened. On July the 2nd, 1982, in a backyard in San Pedro, California, Larry took a lawn chair and tied 42 helium-filled balloons to it. He tethered the chair to the bumper of a friend's car with a couple of ropes. He loaded his provisions, which included several sandwiches and a six-pack of Miller Lite. He also packed a pellet gun so that he could pop a few of those balloons if and when he was ready to come down. And then he secured himself into that lawn chair. His plan was to float across the desert all the way to the Rocky Mountains. As his friends looked on, Larry leaned over and cut one of the two cords anchoring that lawn chair to the car bumper, and unfortunately, the second cord snapped at the same time, launching Larry way up into the skies over LA. Larry's plan was to level off at about 30 feet above the ground. Instead, his friends watched as he disappeared out of sight up to 16,000 feet. Larry decided it probably wouldn't be a good idea to shoot any of his balloons at that height, so he stayed up there drifting over Los Angeles for more than 14 hours. It was then that he realized he had drifted into the flight path of airliners coming into LAX. Now, legend has it that a Pan American pilot was the first one to spot Larry. The pilot immediately radioed air traffic controllers to tell him, I just passed a guy in a lawn chair with a gun. <laughs> <laughs> and while the Air Force, while the Air Force was probably deciding whether to scramble fighter jets in his direction, Larry started popping those balloons with his pellet gun, but then he accidentally dropped his gun. And after drifting for more than a couple hours, Larry's balloons eventually lost enough helium to bring him back to Earth. He became entangled in some power lines in the Long Beach neighborhood. Fortunately, fortunately, Larry survived without serious injuries. So except for Larry Walters, people don't just float away. But here we have a story where Jesus was lifted up and taken out of sight of the disciples. And there they were, standing with their mouths open, looking up to heaven. For all their failures and shortcomings, you have to feel some empathy for these guys. You know, they had responded immediately to this guy, this call to leave everything that they had and to follow him. They did that. They had traveled with him through Galilee to Jerusalem only to see him apprehended and tortured and crucified. But then, just like that, he was back, alive and well, having been raised from the dead. And for some 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus walked and he talked with them. He broke bread with them. He explained lots of things that had not made much sense to them before his death and his resurrection. And he told them they were going to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. And then, just like that, as a final confirmation of his divinity, Jesus is lifted up into heaven right before their eyes. And there they are, yet again, absent one Jesus. Here, gone. Here again, gone again. You know, we've seen a fairly good amount of leave-taking of late right here in this place. Over the last couple of weeks, we've said goodbye to Jack and Sophia and Nancy and Luke and Shelby, all of whom are moving to be closer to their respective families. We've honored high school seniors, which means we'll be saying goodbye to them as they launch into the next leg of their journey. And we're in the midst of saying goodbye to dearly beloved members who have died. We remember Joe on Friday. We will celebrate Dick's life this afternoon and Margaret's in three short weeks. We are, or soon will be, missing all of these folks. And while we're happy for them, whether they're relocating or they're commencing to another degree or career path, or whether they're now in the loving arms of their Savior, we can't help but feel their absence. In his comments on the ascension of Jesus, Lutheran pastor Bradley Schmeling poses an interesting perspective on all of this. He says, there's melancholy and uncertainty in this ascension. 
just behind the great fullness of Easter comes the confusing absence. Both experiences are bound together in the life of faith. We love the power and the directness of Easter, lilies and trumpets, appearances behind closed doors, but there's something inside us that knows we can't take that every day. We need space to stare at the cloudy sky, moments to wonder if our experience is really true. We need absence as much as presence. Those disciples needed the absence of Jesus. It was in that absence where they discovered they could love like he did. They could teach. They could bring others together like he did. They could spread the good news like he did. When Jesus was with them, he showed them the way to God. When he was no longer with them, they began to see that God was everywhere, even in themselves. Maybe, maybe we too need the absence of Jesus. Maybe we need this Sunday that beckons us beyond the anxiety of not knowing what's next into that divinely established purpose of life in the meantime. Life in the meantime. Why do you stand looking up toward heaven? Those two men in dazzling robes asked the disciples on that mountaintop. Perhaps they were the same two who had asked the women on that first Easter morning, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, but he's risen. And then these two guys went on to say, this Jesus who's been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go. In other words, Jesus has not gone away from them. He's gone ahead of them. The great theologian Karl Barth reminds us that the only thing that changed with the ascension is that Jesus changed his vantage point from which he now operates. But with that change came another one. Jesus left his disciples and us to hold down the fort. Today is not a day to crane our necks toward heaven. Instead, it's the time to get on with our commission, to get on with the business of being faithful followers of Jesus here and now. And besides, you know, it's awfully tough to see what's going on around us if all we're doing is looking skyward. And what's going on around us is the oppression and the suffering of a lot of folks. The oppression and suffering of the earth itself. There are fiery ordeals afoot. Those who are hurting those who need someone to speak up for them, those who need to be challenged to do the right thing, those who need to be reminded that they do not walk through this life alone. But there are also incredibly glorious things happening that we would also miss if we just looked up. Babies are giggling. Jimmy is gazing deeply into my eyes. Little ones are feeling the thrill of ocean waves for the first time. Couples are falling in love. Music is being written. Gardens are beginning to offer up their produce. There are daily discoveries of the wonders of being made in the image of God. There are new realizations regularly of where it is God is calling us as a church and the tools we've been given to accomplish that. The power of the absence of Jesus is really the presence of Christ in a powerfully new way. As one writer notes, when Jesus is not among us as another specific body, he's accessible to all as life-giving spirit. Why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you will come in the same way as you saw him go. And then, Luke writes, the disciples returned to Jerusalem back to that room upstairs. They were on their own now. They knew something powerful was coming, but they didn't have a clue what that really meant. Not just yet, anyway. But they were about to. Just wait till next week, when the wind starts to whirl. Amen.